one's new here, um, weren't here last time, or otherwise, um, you know, it's been a week. <laughs> Weeks are busy times, right? Uh, <coughs> so the core uh, component of what St. Francis was really instructing us on and talking to us about in the first part is really a purification, right? Um, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, a purification from the sins that um, that trouble us, that cause us, um, you know, difficulty, um, as well as the affections toward those sins, whether these sins are mortal sins or are venial sins. We stopped a little bit before we got to that point, about talking about dropping affection to venial sin. Um, but long and short of that, um, just to cover that, is uh, venial sins are. <coughs> um, things which displease God, and if we um, continue to do them, we will continue displeasing God. Now, we'll never be free of venial sin entirely in our lives in this life. Um, we fall short, we're human, we have concupiscence. You know, all of the saints, to one degree or another, uh, struggle with venial sin, with the exception of Our Lady. Um, and also, tradition uh, mentions St. Joseph, and uh, St. John the Baptist is also having never committed any personal sins, which um, wow. Uh, <laughs> but aside from that, all of the millions, billions of people that have lived since then, we struggle with sin um, and having committed those as well. Um, and another thing that we need to do with venial sin, just as we would do with mortal sin, is we also need to cut out the, um, the consent to them, the affection for them. You know, like we talked about with mortal sin, specifically with Lot's wife last week, where um, you know, in, you know, in Sodom, you know, God called out Lot and his wife, but she looked back. And of course, where, how did she end up after she looked back at the place of her sin? Oh. A pillar. E exactly. A pillar of salt, no longer alive, <clears throat> not living anymore. And that was, remnant of that, I'm told. <clears throat> I don't know if that's true. I've heard about that. I've heard of that too. I just, I haven't seen any evidence, but yeah, it very well could be. I mean, yeah. she's salt, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, and while venial sin is not nearly as serious, um, the consent and affection for those things is also in and of itself a willingness to displease God. And so we want to cut that out too. Um, we talked about the purification, <coughs> and you talked about um, you know, an effective way to, or what we really need to do in order to really, you know, I'll cut this out, is to work towards and prepare for a general confession. Now, one thing that I didn't mention last week that I'm sure everyone here is probably uh, wise enough to think of this, but it's good to mention as well, general confessions usually take a while. And so it is generally not the best practice to get into the confession line at, you know, 4 o'clock on Saturday and then say, Father, I'd like to make a general confession. Uh, <coughs> Because no one else is getting to confession that day. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, you know, and especially if you really do the detail that's really necessary um, to do that. Obviously, if you have serious sin and it's been a long time and you need to go to confession, just go. And if it takes a long time, it takes a long time. Um, but with a general confession, it's best to make an appointment with a priest ahead of time, um, just so that you know we're courteous to everyone else who in this room wants to make a general confession or even wants to make a regular confession just because we're sinners and we need God's mercy. Um, <coughs> and that's really, um, you know, that first uh, part is really about all us moving towards that purpose or to that, to that goal of being purified from sin so that we could begin living in a way that is <coughs> devout. One of the methods or one of the things that he says that we should do um, in order to get a proper um, awareness of both our own sin and to um, rid ourselves of the, um, oh, was it the affection? Sorry, my memory is failing me. Um, oh, yeah, the purification from, um, yeah, the affection to sin is, <coughs> excuse me. Man, I was doing fine before I was talking. <laughs> um, but the, um, 
the thing to do is to spend some time in these meditations. That was actually the first of the meditations that he recommends. I don't know if you recall, um, but last week we talked about how he recommends doing these meditations in the morning. Um, you know, when you're, you're fresh, you've just slept, um, and um, you're able to kind of reflect and spend on these things. Now, he also um, he recommends spending actually a significant amount of time on each of these. What we did was a cursory glance overview of the meditation. He actually recommends taking with each of these about half an hour to an hour um, which, with each of these meditations, you know, just one in the morning that we can continue moving forward with. Um, but he doesn't really speak a lot about the method to use as we're going through it. Um, he has it kind of in there as, as what to do at the beginning of each section, and then he goes through. Um, but the actual method for doing this, <coughs> excuse me, man, um, is um, contained at the beginning of the second part, of part two. Um, and that's one of the ways that this book is organized, is there's going to be, you know, material and things that you're going to need at later points for earlier points and things at earlier points you're going to need to refer back to when you're at later. It's, um, this book is a work. It's not a book you can just read through beginning to end, got the things, I'm going to go forward and I'm going to do all of that. Uh, it's not a self-help book. Um, it's an introduction to a life. And a life is, um, it's not something that we can just read and then be done with. It's something we live. And so to live a devout life, and to be properly introduced, this is a book that we're going to have to refer back to. Um, that's why last week I didn't give any specific homework, because I figure if we're getting into this, we're reading it, we're following the saint's advice, um, he'll give you enough homework that I won't need to give you any, <coughs> and the Lord will inspire you in the ways that you need to um, in order to begin living in this way. Um, and so, in beginning with the second part, what I would like to do today is actually spend a lot of time really in the very first couple of chapters of, of this, the first um, six or seven chapters, um, where he spends time talking about mental prayer. Um, when I say mental prayer, um, who here knows like, kind of what I'm talking about when I say that? Okay. Most of us have at least some concept of, of mental prayer. That's good, um, because sometimes people have no idea, and then we go, okay. <laughs> um, but I figured people would have at least some, some um, practice of it. Um, so he starts off talking about the beauty of prayer, the necessity of prayer. And instead of paraphrasing and trying to say what he says, I'm just going to uh, briefly read um, the very first paragraph of the second part because he says it better than I ever will. He says, prayer brings our mind into the brightness of divine light and exposes our will to the warmth of divine love. Nothing else can so purge our mind from its ignorance and our will from its depraved affections. It is a blessed fountain which, as it flows, revives our good desires and causes them to bring forth fruit, washes away the stains of infirmity from our soul, and calms the passions of our hearts. Prayer is, as many of the saints have said and is commonly said, is it's, it's talking to God. Um, and how are we to have a relationship with this wonderful person who is Jesus Christ, this wonderful person who, as we went over last week, um, did so much for us, sacrificed himself, you know, emptied himself out um, to be among us as a man. How can we have a relationship with him we don't talk to him, right? And I know you've all heard this before, but it bears repeating because I need the reminders frequently as well, is to spend the time to talk to God. You never regret having done so. <coughs> our lives are busy. Our lives have lots of things going on, but nothing is more important than that relationship because that's the point of our whole existence. It's the point of everything <coughs> that we do is that relationship, that communion with Jesus Christ, um, with the Father, with the Holy Spirit. Um, these are, they're everything. He's everything. 
Um, and in this, in, in developing this relationship, <coughs> I am so very sorry. Um, one excellent way to have this relationship with the Lord and to cultivate it more deeply, more fully, is in mental prayer. Because what we're doing in mental prayer, um, and St. Saint, Saint, uh, Francis, he, he says the very next sentence of what I read, he says, Above all, I would recommend mental prayer, the prayer of the heart, that drawn from the contemplation of our Savior's life and passion. Um, he recommends it above all forms of prayer. He goes on and he talks about how the rosary is a beautiful prayer. He talks about how there are all sorts of wonderful prayer traditions and verbal prayers and things that are very fruitful and that we should do. But if there's one thing, one kind of prayer that we're going to maintain, that we're going to build up our lives on, it needs to be mental prayer because this, is, this prayer is developed, or it, it's contemplating on our Savior on his life, on the deep things, and then entering into communion with him, listening to what he speaks to us in these prayers as we contemplate these things. <coughs> um, and he gives us a method, thankfully, um, because I don't know about you, but I get very distracted in mental prayer if I don't have a particular focus, if I don't have something that I'm, that I'm working on. And so um, we're going to walk through most of our time is going to be spent kind of on this method so that um, we can really have fruitful times of prayer, and fruitful times of, of, of meditation, um, and then, you know, and, and also to be able to go back to that first part and going through those meditations affect that purification that we need in order to begin living this devout life. And so the first thing that he says is important is to place ourselves in the presence of God. Um, <clears throat> this is critical because um, this is the whole point, again, right? Like we just talked about. The whole point is this communion with God. So we need to place ourselves in his presence. And there's a couple ways to do that um, if, because it can be kind of a difficult idea. Okay, I'm going to place myself in the presence of God. God, I'm here. And in a certain sense, that's actually true. You can do that. You present yourself, and there you are. Um, but sometimes to come to that realization or something, um, or even to just really get us to that place, we need to some helps. And so the first way that he recommends is to remember that God is universal. God is everywhere. There is no place that God is not. And so when I place myself in the presence of God, I first acknowledge his, good, his, his awesomeness, how great he is, his omnipresence. And then, and the second one, which is the most helpful for me, is remembering that God is in you. <coughs> God dwells in you. So long as we're in a state of, of uh, you know, grace, um, God dwells in us, right? If you're not in a state of grace, we'll find a priest, we'll get you to confession. <laughs> um, but the Holy Trinity, the creator of the universe, our Savior, our friend, all of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell within us. As uh, St. Francis, as, as the heart of our heart, as the spirit of our spirit, he dwells in you. So to place yourself in his presence, you just open up, up to the one who's already there. Third way um, that could be helpful is to focus on the thought of God. See, God is thoughts are always on his creation. And in particular, they are on baptized Christians because we are his children. Through baptism, we become children of God, right? And so um, we can contemplate on the fact that, okay, God, God is everywhere. God is in me. He's also thinking about me. And sometimes um, it can also be helpful to imagine uh, what he... What, um, St. Francis says is his sacred humanity. Basically, sit down as you're sitting in the chair or on the couch, right, as you're continuing, as you're beginning to, maybe in the pew in church, if you have the opportunity, um, kind of remembering God's existence, God being present, and then 
Imagine him sitting right there. To me, that's kind of a slightly cheesy idea, but at the same time, it's a really good one, especially if it helps, right? And, and St. Francis recommends it. It's like, you know, he's, he's right there. Um, St. Catherine of Siena had the unique uh, gift of the Lord basically was there all the time to the point where she would actually say, when she would like be praying the divine office, um, you know, she'd say, glory be to the Father and to you and to the Holy Spirit. That's, ah. wasn't the <coughs> she was known for doing this because he was just right there. And in a very real way, he's, he's, he's there with us. St. Francis also mentions that if you're in adoration, you actually don't even need to, write to, to imagine it because he actually is right there. And so it can be very good to spend that time in Eucharistic adoration. It should be noted that this particular archdiocese, of course our parish, um, is unique for the number of um, perpetual adoration chapels that we have. Um, it's one of the largest per capita in the world. Um, so take advantage of Eucharistic adoration being um, available. All right, so then, so, so that's the first part, is placing ourselves in the presence of God, just acknowledging his presence, um, that we're there, we're with him. <coughs> the second um, thing to remember, or uh, to do, is to invoke God. Um, once we realize we're in the presence of God, we're going to realize something rather profound. And that is that we're in the presence of God. <laughs> the immense, powerful God. And at least sometimes, if not every time, we're going to realize our own unworthiness to do that. Um, because we're just creators. But at the same time, he's the one who beckons us. And so um, St. Francis recommends... Um, you know, what he calls an invocation, um, which can be something very, very simple, of just something, you know, like a quote from scripture, for example, from Psalm 50, um, Psalm, uh, uh, David's psalm of, of, of repentance after he had, he had sinned. It says, cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Or um, he had a couple more that were really good. I want to, I don't want to get them wrong, so I'll pull them up right here. Um, all right, sorry, one second. Um, another one from Psalm 118. <coughs> Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thine ordinances. Um, from the same Psalm, give me understanding, and I will search thy law, and I will keep it with my heart. I am thy servant. Oh, give me understanding. So much more. Um, it can also be good to invoke your guardian angel um, and ask the guardian angel to help you in this time to stay focused to, um, and to really hear what God has to speak to you um, because that's the whole purpose of this, right? It's to speak with God and have him speak to you as well. Now the third step he says is kind of optional and he says that it's very good for beginners. Um, so I know that's me, probably most of us. Uh, perhaps some of you are uh, much more uh, experienced in mental prayer than I am, and you can move a, a little bit more advanced. Um, but he says to um, imagine whatever it is that we're reflecting on. So for example, if we're reflecting on and meditating upon our Lord's passion, right? Um, to imagine yourself there in, on Calvary, right? And you, you're gazing on, upon the cross, right? Um, and you have, you know, uh, the blessed John, the apostle, and you have the blessed mother there and the other Marys, because there were a lot of them. <laughs> um, or um, if you are, you know, contemplating um, the day of Pentecost, right? Like what it would have been like to be in, that, in the upper room in that moment when the tongues of fire appear. <coughs> um, or things like that, to actually activate your imagination um, on those things, to help you. And so what this does is it allows us to get, have some, something kind of concrete to latch onto for our minds because our minds have this way of wandering, especially when we're trying something new, something that we're not particularly practiced in, a new discipline. Having something that we can latch on to is so incredibly helpful to us. Um, and so imagining that place, um, imagining that um, situation, whatever it might be, it could be if you're, you could meditate on the life of a saint, you could be meditating upon, um, you know, you know, the days of Noah, whatever it is, but you can kind of imagine yourself being in that place 
um, and use that not as the primary element of your meditation, but as a help to kind of contemplate those things a little bit deeper and more um, effectively. Um, this, <coughs> when we contemplate more obscure or abstract things, for example, the, the immensity or the greatness of God, as an example, or the end of creation as it currently is, right, before the new creation, or things like that that we don't really have, we don't know what that looks like, um, this doesn't really work. And St. Francis admits that, that that element doesn't really work. Why? Because um, our brains are limited in that way. And so he says, <coughs> as we're learning this form of prayer and beginning to practice it, um, we shouldn't focus too much on those things. Focus on things that you can um, un, you know, imagine until you can imagine greater. Um, all right, then the next step on this is reflection. So as you imagine these things, as you consider these things, what you're going to naturally do is you're going to start having reflections, considerations, ideas um, that pop up uh, of whatever it might be. We see some examples of what that could be um, in <coughs> uh, the reflection that we just did, right? Those first, um, I think there were three reflections about like, okay, so God created everything, which means that there was a time where I wasn't, and actually there was creation when I wasn't. Okay, you know, and you start pondering these things, right? Remember these and kind of ponder on them and ask the Lord, <coughs> what does that mean? What does this look like? How do you do that? Um, and these reflections are really where um, the mental prayer really starts to take off. We really start to go on this walk with the Lord, figuring out um, how to you know, um, you, know you, you get into the prayer. Um, <coughs> um, and then the next step on this um, is what he calls affections and resolutions. Right? And he had some examples of what those things might be um, at the end of that meditation that we looked at, right? And what these are is the affection is a realization about something in your life, in your prayer, where, <coughs> um, where it's like, you know what? This is something that I need to address or I need to do something about. It could be something very concretely like, oh, this thing that I do, I probably shouldn't do. Um, I have an example from my own life. Uh, a few years ago, um, I'm a younger guy, and one thing that my generation tends to like is uh, video games. And I still like to play those sometimes. Um, and there was this one game that I was playing that, um, like, you know, sometimes we watch movies or TV shows that we probably shouldn't, but we still find some enjoyment in them. Um, and we, you know, write off the bad parts. And we're like, okay, yeah, we'll just fast forward through that and that. Um, in this game, it had some of those things. Anyway, I'd, I'd just gone to confession, and, um, and I was trying to play this game. I was trying to play it in a way that was virtuous. You kind of go through it, and you're this character. And I'm like, OK, what can I, this is a bad world, but like, what, if I, what if I live in a good way? Right? Can, I, can I do that? <coughs> and um, anyway, and I, and I was praying, and I was like, Lord, you know, I don't want to fall into sins, and this and that, and the other thing. And I'm trying to, you know, after confession. And then the Lord was like, you need to stop playing that game. I was like, but I'm so close to finishing. And like, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. And well, OK, fine. And so that was an affection that came up in my prayer with the Lord after confession was, maybe this isn't actually good for my soul. Even if what I'm doing in the game is not objectively sinful, it's still tending toward that. It puts my mind in a particular state. And so then I had to have a resolution, right? So the affection is kind of like this thing that the Lord brings up. And the resolution is what are you going to do about that? And the Lord helps you to do that. And so in that particular situation, it was like, okay, well, this is a very easy one. I was like, okay, <coughs> well, when I go home, I'm going to uninstall the game and it'll be fine. And guess what? My life's been fine since. <laughs> I mean, obviously, struggles and whatnot. But, um, but it was, it was, it's just a game, <laughs> right? And so many things in our lives, it's nothing super serious um, that, that we're dealing with, especially if we're here and we're seeking to live a devout life. We typically don't have deep, terrible you know, things in our lives. We might, and there might be some things. And if we do, we should really root those things out, and we should use these things that St. Francis gives us. Um, as a means of doing so. Um, <coughs> but um, I'm going to spend the, 
um, you know, to have the resolution, right, that comes from this, this time that we've had meditating upon the Lord, listening to what he has to say to us in it. Um, and then there's the conclusion, which is important as well. Um, <coughs> the conclusion of this prayer should end um, with three steps every single time. The first one is thanksgiving, thanking God for coming and spending time with us um, and speaking to us and, and, and revealing these things to us and saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your goodness to me. Thank you for bringing me to this point. Um, you know, things along those lines. Um, the second part is an offering or uh, oblation is another phrase that's sometimes used. And this is an offering um, both of ourselves and as well as the affections and the resolutions because I don't know how many of you have made a New Year's resolution, but I can guess that most of us who have, or most of the resolutions that we've made, didn't make it more than to, you know, February, right? You, you lose it. Um, because we're weak, we're fickle human beings, and we need assistance from the Lord. And so we offer also the resolutions that we have and the affections that, that we have to the Lord and say, Lord, I give this thing to you. I need help in doing this. Lord, make it be so. Um, and Lord, use me, use me as a vessel in the world for whatever you want to accomplish through me. Um, and then the third thing that we need to do is a petition, which means um, start praying for those things that we need. We pray for <coughs> um, any particular things related to the resolutions that we need, um, things like that. We also pray for the church. We pray for our ministers, right? Our priests, you know, here. Praise God, we have good priests here. Um, we pray for... Um, the world. We pray for our families, you know, our, our, our parents, our uh, children, uh, brothers and sisters, and all of these people, because these are important things. People are important, and we need to bring them before the heart of our Lord, where we've been spending this time in prayer. Um, and one final thing that he, he recommends regarding this particular kind of prayer is something called, he calls a spiritual bouquet. He likens um, our time of meditation as like a garden. And when we walk into a garden, we look around and we see these beautiful flowers and things. And what we like to do, even if it's a public garden, we're not really permitted to, um, <coughs> but when we go into a garden, we typically like to you know, pick a flower or two and maybe smell it and whatnot. We should have a couple of things, you know, small, <coughs> maybe little points from the ti our time of med meditation that we can <coughs> take with us out of it and spend that, you know, kind of be able to go back and get the fragrance of that back as we go through our days. And he calls it a spiritual bouquet of just having these, these, these little things that our Lord gave us. Um, okay. Wow. Time went fast. Um, okay. We'll take two more minutes and get through the last couple of things. Um, <coughs> so he gives uh, a couple of pointers um, regarding after this time of prayer, what to do with it. The first one is um, don't rush out of it. Don't rush past the time of prayer. Um, let's say you do it in the morning. Um, do not immediately, once you're done, turn on the TV and get you know started you know on 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 you know cooking the breakfast and doing all these things and get noise into your life as much as possible. Spend just have a little bit of time of silence, so that the transition from you know t prayer and devotion to um, business of life is a little bit more gradual. Um, as much as possible. Obviously, you know, if there's children in the house or, um, you know, you have things that really do need to be taken care of, um, you take care of them, right? And he acknowledges this, like, when you run into someone that you, uh, you know, you have some consideration for that you need to, do it. But we do the best that we can. <coughs> um, treat it as something precious, you know, this time that you've, that you've gained, and you want to make sure that you take good care of that thing that you've gained that's so precious. Um, yeah. Um, he also um, makes it a point to carry out those resolutions, whatever they might be. So for me, uh, in that one particular silly incident of you know, the video game, I had to go home and I had to uninstall it, and I did, um, because that was carrying out the resolution that I had, I had made based upon the affection that God had giz given me. Um, another thing he points out, too, is sometimes you'll start to pray, and the Holy Spirit kind of takes over, and you start having affections, you start having reflections before you've really started the time of meditation. 
<coughs> if that happens, just let it. Follow the Holy Spirit in that situation because the whole point of the meditation is these affections and these resolutions, right? And, and, and hearing the word of God speak to you so that you can respond well. Um, and um, if that comes before the meditation, that's fine. <laughs> in fact, that's a good thing and that's a gift that God has given you on that particular day. Um, <coughs> and so just follow it. Um, you know, this is, this is a procedure and it's a process, but it's a living one. It's one that's made to, um, it's kind of like when you help a, a plant grow sometimes, you follow the directions exactly and things go exactly as they can. But sometimes you realize, you know what, I think it needs a little bit more water or it needs a little less water or it needs you know, different things in order to help it to grow. And what you're doing is you're cultivating your prayer life, kind of like it's a plant, and your relationship with the Lord um, so that it can grow. Um, one, um, one other thing that he addresses that I think is important to address um, is dryness in our prayer. Sometimes that happens. Um, for some of us, that's more times than not. Other times, um, it's rare. Uh, but regardless, dryness in our prayer will happen. And so the question is, is like, okay, so when you're doing the meditations, whatever, what if, what if it's dry? What if there's, there's, there's nothing you know, here? You're not getting anything. And he, he gives a couple of recommendations. <coughs> um, you know, if you have, uh, he, one of the things he recommends is use some vocal prayer to help you out in that, especially also just in the beginning of starting it too. Sometimes um, starting with, you know, some Our Fathers and Hail Marys can be helpful um, or something like that. Um, or to just vocalize, you know, what's going on. Um, sometimes picking up a spiritual <coughs> book, like this one perhaps, um, might be uh, helpful in that too, of just kind of getting that prayer um, going. Um, <coughs> but the one thing that he says is whatever it is, is to be patient and to persevere. Um, even if in a particular time where you sit down to pray and you really just don't get anywhere with it, you've placed yourself in the presence of God. And if God comes and he speaks to you, that's a beautiful, wonderful, great privilege. Um, and if he doesn't, that's okay, but he does desire to spend time with you. And so for whatever the reason in that particular time, when you sit down again, he will come to speak with you and you will be able to have that sort of meditation. But it takes patience. Sometimes you'll have multiple sessions in a time, you know, several days where it just seems like God is distant. Um, and all right, um, I think we should probably um, end it there. There's one other thing that I wanted to talk about. We can do that at the beginning of the next session. I want to <coughs> make sure that you have plenty of time for your small groups. Um, <coughs> and so, um, We'll break up into the small groups, the same as we uh, did last time, the same groups. Uh, the tables are in roughly the same place. Um, one, two, three, four is over there, and then five is in the, uh, in the other room there. Um, if you weren't here before, you're not, in, not sure which group to join, um, I have a list of the groups that we have. Um, and yeah, so, um, th oh, there are also small group uh, questions on the table. Um, spend as much time as you need on each of them. The point isn't to get through all of the small group questions. The small, the, they're just there to help spark conversation um, and to you know, help you to draw deeper into <coughs> this work and then also into um, you know, help with one another or in, into uh, communion. So, all right, there you go. <laughs>